Julio, uh, I have one change to the agenda. Item 6E, which is the uh, Access and Ability Committee. Uh, uh, that um, meeting didn't take place, so we could remove that from the agenda. Thank you. I will make note of that. And I have 6.30 now, so I'm going to start the webinar. What is, uh, do we know our quorum for this evening? Uh, Maria, what did we say it was, 23 or 24? 23. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Mm -hmm. Almost. It needs flags. <clears throat> I hate this thing here. Stop. I don't hear anybody. Did the meeting start? No, Not no yet. Oh, okay, word. I was worried. Okay, no, no. I'll go back on no. mute. <laughs> we're we're Just a little quiet, good. and I'm and I'm taking notes. Sorry. And Julio, say, I, I think we have it now, though. Thank you. People say they can multitask, but uh, that's a lie. I can't talk and type at the same time. Okay, uh, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Uh, I just had to check to see if I was muted and I wasn't. Um, the panic. Uh, good evening, and I see Assembly Member Carol has joined us, and uh, I will give him the floor right now. <laughs> um, go ahead, Assembly Member Carol. Good evening. Thank you so much, Julio. Um, it is great to be here at CB7. Um, we are in the midst of the state budget. Um, the mayor was up in Albany this morning uh, to testify about his priorities and what he would like to see us do in the state budget. A few things that I think are really important that we're trying to get over the finish line. One is to finally uh, fully fund foundation aid for our public schools right here in New York City, which um, I believe we will end up doing, but we got to make sure that um, City Hall, uh, you know, closes that circle so we don't have the same kind of issues we did last year. Um, we are also continuing to fight um, to expand um, the building of renewable energy generation. My bill, the Build Public Renewables Act, a good chunk of it is in the governor's budget, and that would help the New York Power Authority to actually build renewable energy right here in New York State, which is so important to meet our climate goals. Um, and finally, there's a lot of big, big issues still on the table around housing and trying to protect tenants uh, in our budget and make New York more affordable. The governor had put a broad proposal of building 800,000 units of housing around train stations, as well as uh, in suburban uh, and exurban areas that have good uh, train access, but um, low density of housing. Um, another big thing that we're trying to get done, um, we, we were able to announce uh, last week 
with the school's chancellor at PS 295, in, which is in CB7, as well as at PS 107, a new structured literacy program for both of those schools that my office helped fund at $100,000. If you have children uh, in schools and you care about literacy, you know we are funding schools throughout my district and in adjacent places to make sure that all of our children become fluid and fluent readers. And I will be having a full budget town hall on what we're doing in Albany on March 23rd, Thursday, March 23rd uh, at PS9 in Prospect Heights. We'll get you more details um, in a, li a little later uh, in the month. Um, but that's all that I have right now. If anybody has any specific questions, happy to quickly answer them, but I know you have a full agenda. Thank you, Assembly Member. Uh, do we have any questions from board members? Got a silent room tonight. Uh, I do have one question, uh, Assembly sure. Member. Um, and you know what? That question just left my brain. So I'm going to just let it go. Uh, uh, you know how to get a hold of me, Julio. Uh, so please, please do follow up if, you, if, if it hits you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, all right. Thank you, Assembly Member. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Uh, good evening again, everyone. Uh, I'd like to officially start the February board meeting of Community Board 7. Uh, my name is uh, Julio Peña III. I'm chair of CB7. Uh, I like to uh, ask uh, my esteemed colleague Beverly to start us off with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag, the flag. of the United States, States of, America, of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation, under God, un under God indivisible, so. with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Beverly. Uh, Maria, would you please call the roll? Sure, okay. All right, board members, I will be calling your name. Once you hear your name, unmute yourself, say hero present, and once again, mute yourself. Thank you. Ramon Acevedo? Present. Thank you. Amel Afzal? Present. Thank you. Sanjo Alfonso? Sanjo Alfonso? Grisela Amador? Present. Thank you. Hennis Aquino? Present. Thank you. Joan Body? Here. Thank you. Gladys Bruno? Present. Thank Good you. Good evening, everyone. You're welcome. Joseph Canale? Joseph Canale? Jerry Chen? Jerry Chen, Justin Collins, Justin Collins, Christina Das, Christina Das, John DeLuper. Present. Thank you. Beatrice Asapio. Present. Thank you. <laughs> David Estrada. Present. Thank you. Cynthia Felix. Present. Thank you. John Fantillas. John Fantillas. Ken Fung. Present. Thank you. Cynthia Gonzalez. Present. Thank you. Diana Gonzalez. Present. Thank you. Hector Gonzalez. Here. Thank you. Kenny Guan. I'm here. Thank you. Nicole Huang. Here. Thank you. John Johnston. I'm here. Thank you. Present. Beverly Kleinman. Beverly Kleinman. Wei Ko. Wei Ko. Barbara Lee. Present. Thank you. Christina Lem. I'm here. Thank you. Jimmy Lee. Jimmy Lee. Leonette Lopez. Present. Thank you. Paul Mack. Uh, I'm here. Thank you. 
Antoinette Martinez. Antoinette Martinez. Aurelis Martinez. Present. Thank you. Marilyn Melman. Present. Thank you. Dan Murphy. Present. Thank you. Julio Peña III. Present. Thank you. Rovika Roskinshan. Karen Rolnick. Present. Thank you. Patricia Ruiz. Patricia Ruiz. Damaris Santiago. Present. Thank you. Sam Sierra. Present. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Victor Swinton. Present. Thank you. Cindy Vandenbosch. Present. Thank you. Catherine Walsh. Present. Thank you. Cesar Zuniga. Present. Thank you. And Beverly Kleiman once again. Yes, I'm here. I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Roll call called. Thank you, uh, Maria. Um, I like to now move on to the adoption of the agenda. Um, everyone should have received it via email uh, earlier this week. There is one correction to the agenda. Um, the, let me make sure I have this correct. The Ability and Access Committee did not meet this week. So there um, will be no minutes presented and no uh, items discussed unless Cindy wants to share any news. Um, so that will be the only addition. And I see Pat Ruzzi's hand up unless she wanted to add something. No, I just wanted to say that I'm here. I miss roll call and motion to adopt the agenda as is. Thank you, Pat. Is there a second? I see Beverly Kleiman with her hand up to second. Uh, are there any ob uh, objections to adopting the agenda? Seeing or hearing none, the agenda is so adopted. Um, moving on to uh, adoption of the minutes from the January 18th, 2023 board meeting. Motion to adopt. So moved. Second. Who seconded? Gladys. Thank you, Gladys. Uh, seconded by Gladys Bruno. Uh, are there any objections to adopting the minutes from the January 18th board meeting? Seeing or hearing none, it is so adopted. Um, before we go on to public comment, um, I did see that um, the executive officer of the 72nd precinct is on, and I did want to give uh, him a moment to speak, and I see he has been promoted to a panelist, so... Um, XO uh, saying, if you're here uh, and you wanted to speak, feel free to unmute yourself. Yes, I'm here. Uh, so our CEO, the uh, Captain Soros, was not available. That's why I'm, I'm taking her spot in this uh, in this meeting. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, any, if you have any question regarding the 72 breathing command, you can always uh, give me a you know uh, a call or uh, okay. ask a question from here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anyone have any questions for uh, the executive officer of the 72nd precinct before we continue with the agenda? Cynthia Felix, go ahead. Hi, Exel Sang. I am um, just would like to know, I read on the, in the paper today that the suspect who robbed the jewelry store on February 5th, 2023 on Fifth Avenue that he was apprehended today. Can you just um, tell us a little bit about that? Uh, correct. It was uh, apprehended by one of my uh, uh, public safety team yesterday. Uh, right now, he's uh, in central booking, you know, going through the court system. And I can't really give too much this specific regarding like the charges and everything, but he, he's uh, definitely uh, the one that uh, did the robbery that's on the uh, Fifth Avenue. Thank you. And any updates? I know and everybody has um, prayers in mind for the victims of the um, 
out of control. You haul driver. We know we had a, a person right here in Sunset Park that um, is in NYU that got hit on 55th and 4th Avenue. So um, we would appreciate as the case moves forward, any updates. This is, you know, another trauma that our community endured not too far from what happened at the subway. Thank you, Cynthia. Um, so moving on, uh, continuing with the agenda, um, the first item is public comment, and this is for any item on the agenda. And Cynthia will, uh, Cindy, excuse me, Cindy Van Bosch will share uh, the agenda. And keep in mind, uh, the only change is uh, the ability and access committee to not meet. So if there are any members of the public who like to speak on an item that is on the agenda, you may do so now by raising your hand in the Zoom room. Julio, there are a couple of hands up, three I see so far. Four. Okay, can you go ahead and call them for me, Jeremy, please? You got it. Uh, Ellen Osuna, uh, you can unmute yourself. Ellen Osuna. Yes, hello. Um, I would. You've muted yourself now. Ellen Osuna. All right, we can hear you. Okay. You're unmuted. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to speak in regard in regard to the presentation from the Office of Technology and Innovation. And um, when they are inevitably asked what the safety situation is for the health of the people who are living and working in close proximity to these towers, they're going to defer to the federal regulations and they're going to ensure you that all emissions are well under the federal guideline. However, what they don't say is these federal guidelines were set in 1991, rubber stamped in 1996, and are based on the studies done in the late 1980s. That And the premise does not take into consideration that pulsed um, microwave radiation can have any effect on any living being below the level of which causes heat. So if one follows that premise, then there's really nothing they need to tell, tell anyone on that other than it's below the regulations, how to make it least intrusive as possible with people moving on the sidewalk, et cetera. However, that is a giant gaslighting because there is so much evidence that there are serious biological effects, especially considering proximity and duration um, to pulsed uh, radio frequency radiation at levels far below that which cause heat. So, you know, I'm not a technical expert, but I can understand when we're being lied to. And this conversation cannot be complete without hearing from technical experts who also understand both the benefits and the risks of saturating cities with these transmitters. So um, please listen to people like Kent Chamberlain and Frank Clegg when they describe what happens at the biological level when this pulsed radiation is you know, next to people's windows. So. Thank you. Thank you. I have uh, and a, a reminder to everybody, there is a three minute time limit, uh, not that we did reach it for the last speaker. Uh, so I have Gordon Huang next. Gordon, you can unmute yourself. Hello, can folks hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you for giving me a chance to speak. Um, I would like to propose the committee to uh, give a hearing for the public in regards to a proposed law called Fair Chance for Housing Act in which uh, this law will, if dust gets passed, it will prevent um, landlords uh, to, as well as man property management from conducting background check on potential tenants. Uh, this law, while it's um, good in intention, it does provide 
it does have problem in that where uh, landlord, especially small landlord where we live in the property that we rent out, uh, we will not have a chance to vet thoroughly the uh, potential tenants that lives with us within the same building. So if you talk about you know small apartments where there's only two unit where the landlord lives in one unit and you have tenants in another unit that's just upstairs where you know the kids plates outside you know everybody it's like one big family and if the owners does not have a chance to you know properly vet the tenant it you know it's it's really unfair um it's unfair in that well if you're going to apply such law on the property owners why not why are we not applying the same law to things such as employment why are governments as well as employers are also doing background check on their potential hires you know if we're going to do something like this it should be applied across the board for everybody thank you thank you um, i have julie martin next julie you can unmute yourself Hi, um, thank you. Um, yes, I, I'm also been following the Link 5G issue and I wasn't sure if you've already had a presentation or if there was gonna be one tonight, but um, uh, I, um, with a group that studies environmental toxins and electrosmog is not really recognized as one, but it really should be. Um, I I work in the area, I, I um, I uh, love Sunset Park very much. I, I see that these poles are only in the manufacturing areas, but I know that people live and, and work. It's a pretty dense uh, community. So I just would like uh, you to know that there are community boards around the city that are not happy with the way that these things are being rolled out. There wasn't enough community review. There's, there's um, not enough notification. Uh, and uh, not not enough known about the wireless the health effects of wireless radiation. I would also suggest bioinitiative report, which really goes into so many different body systems and the types the, the volume of science that's out there. So this is a controversial subject. I wish that community boards can call for maybe a town hall of sorts, so that you know people can, on all sides can kind of get on the same page. You know, at least air these differences. Um, also, if if they are still coming to present to you, I would. I would urge you to ask uh, Mr. Sikoff why there was no environmental assessment statement done for this particular project. I know in the past for the small cells, for instance, they at least gave a negative declaration, but you know, and these are much more involved structures with five you know, different types of emissions antennas. Um, so I would ask him if why there was no environmental statement done. Um, so thank you for, for giving me an opportunity to ask these questions. Thank you. Thank you. I have Arnold Gore next. Arnold, you can unmute yourself. Uh, Arnold, I see uh, you. Right I, yeah, um, I'm Arnold Gore um, uh, from uh, Brooklyn, New York in Prospect Heights. I'm opposed to the installation of the Link NYC uh, kiosks with poles. There have been numerous studies documenting the increased health problems, including elevated brain cancer rates dec and decreased fertility associated with wireless. Uh, see um, ehtrust.org slash science. Insurance companies will not ensure the safety of wireless networks. And this just adds an additional layer of uh, liability protection being denied. The DC Circuit Court of Appeal which is one low, one level below the Supreme Court, has ordered the Federal Communications Commission to update its 25-year-old standards on August 8th, 13th, 2021. In over a year and a half, they have not done that. We should be able to determine the technology being used. Wired technology is much superior. See the presentation of Dr. Timothy Shekel, uh, PhD at New Yorkers for wiredtech.com slash media. If you page down to his presentation before community board one in Queens, you will see uh, a detailed uh, 
uh, information about this. The city council can stop this deployment of towers. The Federal Telecommunications Act still affirms the right of localities to permit installations of equipment for transmission of cellular telephones. The telecom must show there is a gap in service. There usually is not, but if there is, the power needed to complete a telephone call is far below the power full installation that is being requested. It is necessary that the city enact zoning and siting regulations. A good law was adopted in Woodstock, New York as a model, but one must be tailored uh, to the needs of our city. Th thank you. And I will mail a copy of this since there are links in there, which uh, uh, you wouldn't be able to reach without it. If you give me uh, an email to uh, send uh, this material, I'll send it. We will do that, sir. Thank you. Okay. I have Damien Andrade next. Damien, you can unmute yourself. Okay. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, I would just, I guess, like to address like the waterfront issue regarding like the projects and like for instance regarding pier six as well because i feel like the community has not been very much um aware of like the projects that's going on in ways that um i believe there's also like a film studio that's also going to be built that got approved to be built down in the waterfront and just ways like how the community board is going to try to like um kind of address that situation regarding like um job wise because i feel like building that film studio selected amount of people will be from the community will be beneficial from that um site and plus pure six it looks like that it's going to be built as a parking lot and i feel like um definitely the community board should have definitely addressed have more like you could say town halls to see how Pier 6 could have been like beneficial to the community more than towards them because right now it's built for a parking lot is going to be built from a parking lot to benefit the film studio and it kind of just shows like the film studio the the job wise is definitely going to be benefiting people from outside of the community compared to those who are in this community and I feel like that studio should definitely benefit us as you know Sunset Park residents, not like those outside, but yeah. Thank you, Damien. I have Theodora Scarado next. Theodora, you can unmute yourself. Thank you so much. Um, my name is Theodora Scarado. I'm executive director of Environmental Health Trust. We're a scientific think tank that recently won our lawsuit against the Federal Communications Commission regarding their outdated limits for human exposure to radio frequency radiation. That's the radiation emitted from cell towers, 5G new networks. Um, what, what our case was about was that the FCC, despite being uh, provided over 11,000 pages of scientific, ex, um, scientific studies, as well as policy recommendations and experts and people from all over the world actually submitted to the FCC, they decided to just keep the limits that they set in 1996. Now, those limits are actually from science in the 70s and 80s, which is like a whole story. But the FCC was ordered to uh, provide the uh, their, to really do their homework to show how why are they keeping these absolutely outdated limits in, in our opinion, of course, um, when there's all of this science and they were ordered to show uh, what information about uh, impacts to children, their vulnerability, how are the limits protective against long term exposure? What about environmental impacts? Um, and actually several and also with 5G with this new technology that of course, there was no pre market uh, safety testing before it rolled out in the market. Um, how do these limits, how do we know that the public is protected? Well, it's been uh, almost two years, and not quite, and the FCC has not responded. There hasn't been any adequate review by any federal agency that looked at all of the science on this issue. It simply hasn't been done. And also at the federal level, this issue really represents the concept of a regulatory gap. There's been no pre-market safety testing. There's no post-market surveillance for health effects. 
like you would have for drugs. There was no risk analysis on the, risk analysis on the health effects of long-term exposure. Um, and there's no monitoring of the levels. And in addition, in New York, which I find quite shocking because we actually don't have this situation in uh, DC where I am, um, you know, there's no uh, presentation of the RF compliance reports that show that the levels are compliant when installations are put in and they're not put up transparently for the public to have access to, which every community should be afforded. Now, one of the problems is that at the national level, and all of this is unlike many other countries that, by the way, have limits 10 to 100 times more stringent than the United States, I should add. Um, but uh, in New York, we have been asking the city for this information. There have been FOIAs for this information, and that hasn't been provided. If you're interested in the issue, please go to ehtrust.org. That's our organization. Or go to the ProPublica article by reporter Peter Elkin called How the FCC Shields Shell Phone Companies from Safety Concerns. Or you can go to Dr. Joel Moskowitz at UC Berkeley and read his blog. Or you can go to the Harvard Report by Norm Alster, which found that the wireless industry is using using big tobacco tactics, and that the FCC is captured by the wireless industry, as well as a former FCC uh, lawyer, Erica Rosenberg. You can look that up. She Thank did a piece on the FCC is captured as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Julio, uh, I've reached the end of uh, the hands up. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, so now moving on to the committee reports. Uh, we have the Transportation Committee, uh, and I believe John DeLuber will be giving the report this evening. John? Yes, thank you, Julio. So we have a very full uh, agenda from the Transportation Committee, and I want to ask actually Jeremy if I can have screen sharing rights, because I want to, the first item relates to our February, or our January 23rd meeting about uh, City Harvest and their facility at 150 52nd Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue, uh, which is for a revocable consent to add a new ramp. So if uh, I can get John, just Give me one second to find sure. your name. And you should be able to share now. Cool. Okay. All right, so Zoom, share screen. Can you see the diagrams for? Yes, we can. City Perfect. Okay, so uh, as mentioned before, City Harvest came to us. They're seeking a revocable consent to build this ramp. Um, this is required whenever any facility like a ramp or anything like this impinges on the public right of way. So if they have to use the sidewalk, it has to go before the community board. So there were a lot of great questions raised about this facility, uh, things including whether people could rent the meeting rooms, how the storefront space will be used in here, the size of the ramp, lighting and visibility features, presence of security personnel and cameras, ADA requirements, sidewalk parking issues, ramp materials, placement of trees, bike parking, and signage. After feedback from the board, they agreed to, uh, City Harvest agreed to add some signage to discourage sidewalk parking, and they also said that they would be amenable to working with the board and the community to better understand our needs, how the community space can be used to provide information about trucks coming in and out, and to be an active participant in the neighborhood. So. After this discussion, a motion was passed to grant the revocable consent 10-0. So I'm going to ask if we can do this by unanimous consent. But before that, I want to see if there are any questions or any other information people needed before that. Thank you, John. Uh, are there any questions from the uh, presentation and on the revocable, revocable ooh revocable consent for City Harvest to operate at 150 52nd Street for the ramp. I see two hands up, uh, Cynthia and then Dan Murphy. Cynthia Gonzalez, sorry. Oh, hand went right back down. Okay, Dan Murphy. Yes. I put my hand down too. I just had a question about the address and you answered it. Thank you. There you go. Okay. Any further questions? 
Okay. Um, since this came out of committee, it does not need to be seconded. Uh, and there was a request from the committee that this be passed via unanimous consent. Are there any objections to this being uh, passed via unanimous consent? Seeing or hearing none, the revocable, whoa, the revocable yes. consent uh, is uh, passed unanimously. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone. Uh, echoing Julio's thanks. Um, I do want to also mention the several other things that have come out of the Transportation Committee in the last month. It's been a busy month. At our subsequent meeting early in February, we did discuss the uh, Link NYC kiosks. Uh, there was a presentation from the Office of Technology and Innovation and City Bridge. So they're the ones who have the franchise for these, which replaced public telephones. They provide a lot of services, including internet access, 911, uh, map, uh, 311 and a, a whole bunch of other features. They're looking to build, that, or they are planning on building three new Link NYC kiosks at 117 42nd Street, 10 43rd Street, and 111 58th Street, uh, all in industrial zones. These are in addition to the 17 other Link NYC kiosks already in the district. Uh, this did not require a vote, but they did come to the board seeking our feedback. So uh, members discussed and they shared uh, issues, including the lack of kiosks in Windsor Terrace, uh, concern, uh, questions about using 911 service from the kiosk, signal range and data caps, uh, a non-functional kiosk that was previously uh, located right near one of these new ones is going to go in, battery backup and functionality during adverse weather effects, health concerns about 5G and other wireless equipment, sidewalk accessibility and accessibility for the tele for those who use the telecommunications relay service. After the meeting, the OTI did agree to change their proposal a little bit that they're going to put a screen on the kiosk at 58th Street in response to the uh, feedback there. Also in response to the questions about health and environmental impacts, they noted that this kiosk meets FCC regulations for safety and environmental impacts, and they've provided us some health information, including a C, uh, CEQR memo, and last night sent some additional info about their environmental impact assessment from the, the first set of these kiosks and information about how existing ones were gathered in. This stuff is in our committee report, uh, but we have also asked DO or OTI for additional information, including studies, and we're waiting for more and we will provide updates as we get them. At the same meeting, we also had uh, a robust discussion about neighborhood loading zones. So there is a plan from the Department of Transportation to add loading zones to residential streets to facilitate package delivery, uh, pick up and drop off from car services and similar uses. Right now, the site's DOT has uh, planned our 41st Street between 6th and 7th Avenue and 44th Street uh, between 6th and 7th Avenue. We've raised questions about this before. Um, DOT has not been willing to uh, present to the board on this at uh, right now, uh, but we have asked questions and uh, please look at the committee reports to see more of those. Um, in addition to that, there's been a few other issues that have been raised uh, as well uh, between the last meeting and now. So we've, uh, there's been a lot of talk about the BQE revisioning and in the community, in the transportation committee, we've catalyzed convenings with community partners and with elected officials uh, to try to get more on that done and to try to bring that back to everyone here. So we had a meeting on, there was a there was a meeting on February 9th with community partners, of which um, I, uh, the chair, Katie Walsh, and, and some others, uh, uh, Julia, I, I think you attended as well. Um, and there was also a meeting on January 19th with elected officials about these things where some information was shared. Um, and we're also going to be having on February 22nd at 6.30, a meeting about BQE revisioning with the uh, 
New York City Department of Transportation, um, which is good. There's also been uh, invitations to New York State DOT. Uh, we don't have any information about whether they'll attend or not, but the, that is something that's going to be happening as well. So finally, I know I'm talking everyone's ear off here, but uh, the MTA bus redesign, there was a meeting hosted by the MTA on January 31st. Uh, several board members uh, were there and um, it was open. It was a public meeting. Lots of folks also throughout the district attended. They presented a lot of very dense information. So we're hoping to host a transportation committee meeting that we can, you know, do a little bit more looking at these, talk about some of the issues and provide additional feedback. So uh, keep an eye on your out on your calendars, look to attend this, whether you're a member of transportation or not, but attend our, when we set something up for that, please attend that. And when we do something, and if you're interested in learning more about the BQE revisioning and its impacts here, February 22nd is the meeting for that. So I know that was rather dense, uh, but uh, I can take a few questions uh, if there's anything right now. Thank you so much, John. Uh, any questions uh, for the transportation committee? Dan Murphy. So I got a real question this time. John, did they say they would come back to discuss the loading zones on the residential streets? My understanding is that they said that they are within their rights to put them, that there's no, because there's no vote required there, they're not, they didn't come back to us, uh, but they, they did say that they were planning on presenting something at the borough board. Uh, but that said, we would definitely like them to come present to us, but they, they've said that they do not have the personnel at this time to be presenting to individual boards. So uh, yeah, that's a very disappointing thing to hear because we'd all like to know more about this program and the, also the questions that were asked, you know, how is it, how is this site chose, how are these sites chosen? What's the process? How's it gonna work going forward? We did put a little information about that in the committee report. So I encourage you to read more on that, but but yeah, we would definitely like to see that. And if there's additional feedback, um, yeah, send it our way because uh, until there's until we can have something presented to us, we want to be able to get that information to DOT um, because yeah, it's something that affects people, and we, we would definitely like that shared. Uh, thank you, John, and, and thanks to Katie for the for the work. Do we want to keep an, an eye on this because it's it just just a note. It sounds like. DOT is obviously dealing with uh, the the uh, demand side of the last mile uh, issue, which is us getting our packages, and that's all of us. Um, but they're not, but they they don't they don't seem to be very uh, transparent or deliberate about talking to us about how they're going to do that. So it sounds like a ham-fisted way to deal with the problem, and we should uh, thank you for keeping on top of it. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Any further questions? Okay, uh, so uh, moving on to the housing committee. Um, uh, Antoinette, um, I see that Hi, you're everyone. on. Th Hi you everyone, good evening. Um, so the housing committee has been receiving a number of external and internal meeting requests on a number of various topics. So if you're a member of the housing committee, we really ask that you please attend the coming meeting so that we can work together to build capacity to address the growing number of concerns that are coming in. Um, we're going to be hosting a meeting in March specific to future engagement and prioritizing future meeting topics. Um, with that said, bear with me because I have um, quite a few updates that I, I'd like to quickly mention. The first is that we met on January 25th where we hosted a meeting with the New York Foundation for Senior Citizens um, to provide a presentation on a unique and affordable housing sharing program um, that they're offering which works to link um, senior adults with extra private spaces in their homes or apartments with other adults to share their space. 
um, one of the match meets for the requirements for um, the program are that one of the match meets must be age 60 or older. The program also serves adult hosts age 55 or older who are interested in sharing with developmentally um, disabled adult guests um, who are capable of independent living. Thank, um, shout out to Grisel who worked to organize a follow-up presentation with United Senior Center of Sunset Park on February 10th. Um, the program has placed 24 people in this community board um, over the past years, and they're really hoping to increase their outreach to get that number up. Um, uh, within that same meeting, we also had a separate presentation by Reside New York on the 875 Fourth Avenue apartments. Um, now, as you may know, that site is the former gas station site. Um, and there are going to be apartment buildings um, being built there. Um, an environmental clean um, a cleanup of that site took place and the developer received a 421 tax abatement credit. Um, the developer also received a height increase on that property. Um, with that being said, there are 30% um, of those apartments are being offered on Housing Connect um, and they're currently up until February 20th for folks to apply. Um, there are 152 units in total, with 45 being offered to, um, with 45 units offered um, through Housing Connects, and then 23 of those units are specific to community one. Um, no. Total 107 units that are going to be market rate with two bedroom apartments there going for close to $5,000 a month. So with this being said, um, the housing crisis in CB7 is growing and the committee is working to organize a roundtable conversation with elected officials around these issues and ways in which affordable housing can be created um, in CB7 and preserved. Originally, the committee sought to invite elected officials from all levels of government, um, but through um, guidance from CB7 leadership, it was mentioned that the conversation should be um, a little more focused. So for this first conversation, we've invited state representatives, um, Assembly Member Matinas, Senator Guardas, and Senator Chu to attend a roundtable conversation on February 28th at 6.30, and once confirmed, once their attendance is confirmed, we'll circulate a flyer, um, and we'll also be working to schedule separate conversations with the city, HPD, and federal um, representatives in the coming weeks. Um, we also had a meeting on February 7th with the New York City Office of Environmental Remediation, and they presented on the New York City Voluntary Cleanup Program for a site at 179 22nd Street. This is currently a vacant lot on the corner. Sorry, can the, can the lines be muted? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. So this site is currently a vacant lot on the corner of 22nd Street and 4th Avenue, but it's going to be converted to commercial and residential use. We don't yet have information on what those rents are going to look like um, for that particular site. Separately, the board was alerted um, Monday afternoon of a separate development on um, 60th Street and 3rd Avenue. The address is 6023rd Avenue that is available on Housing Connects with the deadline of March 6th, um, where the AMI household income bands are 99,000 to 138,000 for a two bedroom apartment at about $2,900 for two people. And one bedroom apartment for about $3,100 for income bands from 107 to $138,000 for one person. 
we will need to find ways to connect the to connect with the developer to confirm what the market rates of those apartments are going to be. But regardless, either way, all of this is extremely alarming, and the housing committee will need to work closely with the land use committee to not only educate the com um, the community on these developments, but also to work to be proactive in finding ways to create truly affordable housing options in CB7. So the meeting on February 28th is the first step and we really urge everyone to attend. Thank you, Antoinette. Uh, does anyone have any questions for the uh, housing committee? Brazil. Hi, I don't have a question. I just have a comment. I just want to say thank you very much to Antoinette and also to all on housing committee. Uh, United Senior Center received the visitor of Ms. Barbara Bear. She provided information to the seniors about the home sharing program and was a very great event. And the seniors really, really, you know, get the information that she wants to provide. I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Chriselle. Uh, so moving on to the Public Safety Committee, uh, there uh, is no vote required unless Cynthia has any additional comments uh, for the committee. Yes, I would just like to make um, two comments. Thank you, Julio. Uh, first, we um, did have Captain uh, Christian Suarez with us. She joined us very briefly. She will be coming to a future meeting and we will let you know the date. Uh, just a note that she is the first female commander at the 7-2. We also had a meet and greet with MDC, the Metropolitan Detention Center and their staff. They did update us about some recent upgrades to the facilities and ways they're working to reestablish ties with the community. I wanna thank Jeremy for attending their quarterly meetings. He went to the last two meetings and we were able to find a lot of, uh, a lot about what MDC is doing. They also have a lot of job opportunities. If you go to the report, there is a link to job opportunities that are not correction officers. They do have opportunities for the community. Another um, job opportunity for the community was a presentation on by NYU Langone Hospital. We had Matthew McQuillan, who is the security manager there. And he presented on the NYU Building Bridges Security Guard Training Program. This is a free one week security guard training course, which is tentatively scheduled to begin in March, the last week of March, March 27. It is completely free. Participants will receive a New York State Security Guard licensing. They will get all the required courses. They'll get de-escalations training and other training. Normally, this cost about $500 to $1,000, and it's being offered free to the community. So if anyone's interested, there is a email in the report that you could email Matthew um, directly to get that um, information. And then the last thing is we still have Captain Sang on, Exo Sang on, and I just want him to clarify about the U-Haul because we know it crossed two precincts and we just would like an update on what precinct is handling it. Um, hey, Ms. Kevin Sang, um, just so you know, the uh, we got into U-Haul incidents. Uh, we have one of our uh, incidents that happened in our command is 544 Avenue and the other eight incident is happening in 68 Crazy. And then one more incident with MOS was just struck by the U-Haul happened in 76 uh, command. So. Um, uh, regarding the investigation, I believe it's 6 8. Uh, the tank squad taking in charge regarding it. I'm um, sure it should be 6 8 squad, or if the, you know, because of the fatality occurred, it could be the FI, the FIO, I mean, FID, the fourth investigation division, they could be the investigating the charge for the investigation. But everything is still under investigation. And uh, the only thing I can tell you is, um, the uh, bicyclist that was struck on 4th Avenue and 5th Street is still um, in, um, in a medical-induced coma. So, uh, and that's that's all the information I have regarding this, uh, this incident. Thank you. I also want to thank um, the precinct. Uh, this weekend, there were two big, uh, a big community complaint has been the derelict trucks and vehicles under the BQE. 
And I know that several of them were removed over the weekend and we hope to see continued progress with that. So is there a priority, Exo Sang, on when those will be moved? And I know two of them were removed, including some of the trailer homes that were there. Yes, we are, um, the, the RV, um, yeah, we, we are as the, as the CEOs. Do we want to get rid of these uh, RV and that will be our prioritized uh, jobs? We have uh, spoke with the uh, traffic enforcement division and we have also uh, using our own uh, road tow uh, um, in our private towing company. Uh, you know, we have to issue these RV summonses you know, and make sure there's no one living there and in order for us to tow them. And so far, you know, last week, I think we did two, one on Saturday and one on uh, Thursday. Uh, we continue, we have another schedule with the road tow on this coming Saturday and we we'll continue to try to tow all this RV away from the, uh, you know, either Third Avenue or other street, you know, try, definitely try to help out, you know, whatever the community complained about regarding this abandoned uh, tra you know, trailer and RV. And if you have any, anything, you know, uh, if you see any of these uh, um, conditions, email us and you know, uh, uh, let, let us the uh, community, community affair office know and they will let me know to set, set up these, uh, you know, teamwork with the uh, traffic enforcement unit and also also try to get rid of these, uh, you know, the unauthorized parking uh, RV. Thank you very much. That is it for me, Julio. And Jeremy, I will never, could never steal your thunder. Never. <laughs> Thank you so much, Cynthia. Uh, Pat Ruiz and then Cynthia Gonzalez. You're muted, Pat. Cindy, hi. In, in reference to the security guard training, and I'm sorry that I, I missed a few meetings uh, this month, um, is that for potential hiring at NYU or just to facilitate and help people get their uh, security certificate or whatever they get? So it could lead to potential hiring, Pat. We also asked them if they could do multilingual classes and it's uh, being um, contracted out. So they said that would be a possibility. Um, the only requirement people would have to have is uh, ID and be 18 years of age. The great thing was that thanks to Jeremy having um, the MDC there, they said that they could also use security guards because they have a facility in Bay Ridge. So they said if people go through this training that they would also be open to having to hiring the folks that go through this training. So they would have a state certification that would give them the ability to work anywhere that needs a licensed security guard NYU will have some employment opportunities for them, but of course they can't promise everyone would be hired because you have to go through, you know, their process and, you know, people would have to have, uh, so you do not have to have uh, work authorization to take the course, but you do need to have work authorization to be hired and work at NYU and any other place. Okay, so and my, my second question to that, since you mentioned different languages, so does that mean that even if you take the security uh, training in your language, if it's available, do you need to at least be able to understand and speak the English language? Yes, and that is a state uh, requirement, not a city requirement, a New York state requirement. Yes. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Cindy. Thank you, Pat. Cynthia Gonzalez? Can you hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Um, Cynthia, did they mention how many uh, trainings there, uh, um, how many slots for the upcoming training and when will that happen? So it's scheduled to begin March 27th. They um, have open slots and open opportunities. So they are available and open. The last time I spoke to Matt, which was last week, they already have about 20 people who have signed up, but it was a grant that they received. It was part of the Bessels Foundation grant, Cynthia, that I'm sure you're familiar with since you were there before. So they got a Bessels Foundation grant, and this is one of the ways that they're using the money to try to get um, community members to do something and be involved in something that's normally very costly. There's $500 to $1,000 is a lot. And the person, the people who go through this will have New York State Security Guard certification at the end. 
when they get that certification, they won't be obligated in any way to work for NYU? Nope. No obligation whatsoever. They're okay. free to go anywhere else. Okay. And thank you, Workforce One. I see that is also a good opportunity. So thank you for putting that in the chat. So we have a Workforce One opportunity from Diana and Jeremy that is both at Brooklyn Army Terminal and Fulton Street, a good source of job opportunities for licensed security guards. Almost everyone who's looking to hire security guards sends job listings there. So it seems like a great opportunity and I urge anyone who's interested to take advantage. All you, that's collecting right now is you send them an email and they will contact you when the course is going to begin. And it'll be at NYU. I have another a follow up question. Um, if a person already has a license and wants to apply to NYU, because I know that NYU uses Allied, Allied Universal. So if a person wants to come on board with Allied, are those job openings listed with NYU or do they have to go through Allied? I will find out from Matthew, Cynthia, and get back to you offline. I appreciate. Thank you so much, Cynthia. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, we have a question from uh, Catherine Walsh. I, uh, I have a question that I don't know, Cynthia, if you'd be able to answer this, but um, I think what I hear you saying is that they NYU had funding by way of Jeff Bezos, like some fund or right, grant money, and then this is how they've decided to use it. Did they consult anyone within the community in terms of thinking about how that money should be spent on job opportunities and job development? I, I hear you talking about this specific program, but like in terms of making that decision, did NYU like go and work with anyone within this community they board? A, they have a board of trustees. Uh, I can actually partially answer that question, Katie. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm like 70% sure that NYU put together a like um, a group of yes. like stakeholders to figure out like what to do with this this funding. And I think this was one of the, the resources. There's a couple of others that I just don't know off the top of my head, but this sounds like this is one of them. That is one of them. The other one, Julio and Cesar was a part of it. And I think you too was getting the technology access for the schools. Correct. And the early childhood program, yes. Okay, so I mean, I, I I don't know much about you know um, I don't know much about the profession um, in terms of understanding if it's like good pay. I understand the certification's expensive, but I don't understand if like this is a good paying you know job long term um, and protections and everything. So I, I just wanted to understand if um, uh, who who were the decision makers who were making these recommendations in terms of job access. Um, so I think I'm hearing Julio say that there are a bunch of community board members who were involved in that. Um, and Cynthia, I can follow up with you just to better uh, maybe understand who, who again, who, the, who these decision, you know, decision makers are gotcha. within NYU Langone deciding um, for the community um, what types of jobs are best. Okay. Pat? Yeah, just a, a question as a follow-up to Cynthia Gonzalez. Do we know what this, did they say what the potential starting salaries are for these security guards? They didn't say, but it's something I think I could be able to find out for everyone. Thank you, would appreciate that. Not a problem. And last hand to Jeremy. So there's a question in the Q&A, just asking you to post their uh, uh, contact information. Cindy, if you could do that, I would appreciate that. I will do that right now. Thank you, Jeremy, for pointing that out. Uh, thank you so much, Cynthia. Um, and uh, so moving on to the Economic Development and Waterfront Committee, uh, there is uh, no vote uh, required for that uh, committee, but uh, I will ask Dan if there's any additional comments from the committee report. None. Uh, none, but I do want to remind the entire board there is a Sunset Park Task Force meeting coming up on the 23rd, I believe at 6 p.m., uh, and it is in person at Industry City. I asked 
Christine Paglianga, the uh, portfolio manager for Sunset Park, to uh, to con- for EDC to consider options to live stream it, um, and in any case, record it. Um, but it is right now. Uh, I just want to give you the exact the exactitudes of it. <clears throat> it is at, at Industry City uh, on Thursday, February twenty third. Um, and I do not have a building as of yet. So that, that remains to be, uh, gotten. So if you want to come community, it's on 23rd at Industry City, uh, and Jeremy and I will get the exact location within the facility. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, so moving on to the second roll call of the evening, Maria. Sure. Okay, board members, I will be calling the names of those board members that were not present at the original roll call. Once you hear your name, unmute yourself, say here are present and mute yourself once again. Sandra Alfonso. Joseph Canale. Jerry Chan. Justin Collins, Christina Das, John Fantillas, Waco. Present. Thank you. Jimmy Lee, Antoinette Martinez. Present. Thank you. Rovika Roskinshan, Pat Ruiz. I'm here. Thank you. Okay, second roll call called. Thank you, Maria. You're welcome. Uh, And now to the elected officials report, and I will turn it, and um, I just want to make sure Christina Das just signed on. Christina, can you just confirm your attendance today? Hey, everyone. Christina Das, I'm here. Sorry, I keep getting kicked off. I was on the train. (laughs) Uh, and I will turn it to Natasha for the elected officials report. Thank you. Okay, when I call your name, please unmute yourself. Melissa Safi, representing Senator Gunardis' office. Melissa, if you're still on, can you can please unmute yourself? Hi, I'm here. We can hear you. Hello, are you able to hear me? Yep, we can hear you, Melissa. Perfect, okay, can I go ahead? Yes. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Melissa Safi. I'm the community liaison for Senator Gennardis' office. So I'm gonna start off with our legislative priorities and updates on those things. Um, Regarding the asylum seekers, our office has been working closely with mutual aid groups and other elected Uh, officials to respond to the asylum seekers that have arrived in our neighborhoods and supporting the mutual aid groups and community-based organizations on the ground, such as Mixteca. We want to commend their tireless efforts and the senators fighting hard in Albany to bring funding to our frontline organizations uh, doing this critical work to support our new neighbors. Um, Regarding the Working Families Tax Credit, uh, last Tuesday, Senator Granardis officially introduced the Working Families Tax Credit Uh, to provide working families with increased support while lessening the additional cost to the state. Uh, Regarding housing, uh, last week, Senator Gennardis co-sponsored good cause eviction housing legislation that protects tenants from unjust evictions and rent hikes, uh, giving the majority in the judiciary uh, the legislation needed to move through the committee. Um, Regarding the BQE, This week, our office organized with local, state, and federal elected officials a letter that was sent uh, to Secretary Buttigieg uh, urging no more than two lanes for the BQE to mitigate environmental impact. Um, Our our office also worked with corridor-wide elected officials, releasing a joint statement about the unacceptable response from the state DOT when they refused to commit to actively participate in the BQE process. 
Um, we're going to continue to work with other state elected officials to get the State Department of Transportation to come to the table to find a lasting and equitable solution for the BQE. Um, there's a short survey on the BQE North and South corridors that I will input into the chat when I'm done. Um, and uh, please stay tuned for the meetings that the DOT will be having in March and April for the community. So the first one um, is the BQE South workshop that will be held in person on Tuesday, March 21st from 6.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And the second one is the BQE South workshop uh, that will be uh, virtual and that will be held on Thursday, March 30th uh, from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Um, details for both of those are coming soon. I'll also send um, the link to stay updated on those meetings uh, when I'm done. Um, you can make your voice heard for the Parks Envisioning Initiative uh, for the Herrera Playground Reconstruction Community Input Meeting uh, tomorrow, February 16th at 6.30 p.m. Also, we'll send the registration link. Um, and just a few points about our office. Uh, you know, as you all know, we're open Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. in Bay Ridge. Um, it, it, our address is 8018 Fifth Avenue, Bay Ridge. Uh, we will be moving offices, though, uh, in March uh, to 9th Street between 1st and 2nd Avenue. And currently we are holding mobile office hours at the Brooklyn Heights Public Library. So we're alternating Wednesdays, uh, February 15th, March 1st, and March 15th. Um, and I will put my email in the chat for future references. And uh, thank you all for your time and attention. Thank you so much, Melissa. Okay, next, uh, Edward Serna, representing council member Alexa Vilas' office. Edward, if you're still on, please unmute yourself. Uh, still on. Good. Thank you, Natasha. Uh, good evening, Community Board 7. Um, I want to say happy belated Valentine's Day. Um, as I mentioned last uh, last month, our office has expanded uh, pretty heavily the tax services we are offering, free tax services we are offering at our office. In partnership with Grow Brooklyn, we are having tax services Monday and Wednesday from 2 to 6 p.m. and on Saturdays from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Again, at our district, district office, 4417 Fourth Avenue. Um, I've highly encouraged folks to get the word out. There have been a number of constituents that come in and they're like, oh my God, I just did the taxes and I wish I could have came here, would have qualified and would have been free. So definitely push that to um, your networks and I can forward the flyers to the board if, if folks need them. Um, quickly, uh, we had a meeting um, with uh, Assistant Chief McAvoy, the commanding officer of Brooklyn South. And I want to thank Julio and Cynthia Felix, because although we have a new commanding officer, first Latina, she seems great. Uh, I was able to meet her yesterday at the 72nd Precinct Council meeting. You know, there were still some concerns about how that process unfolded, but the Assistant Chief was really great. We had a meeting. Um, we will be having a follow-up meeting with Chief of Department Madri, which is um, to be announced. Um, because we still have some follow-ups that we want to work through. But again, uh, we're always here to listen to the community. And when concerns were raised, we immediately sprung up. And, and we thank them with PD because they did come to the table to answer questions. Uh, secondly, um, as my previous colleague said, uh, tomorrow, uh, Thursday, February 16th at 6.30 p.m., there will be a virtual input meeting for the redesign of Pena Herrera Playground for folks who don't no, it's the one on Third Avenue behind PS1. Um, this has been a priority of the council members since she first took office. Uh, the playgrounds on Third Avenue, by her estimation, have not received investments for over a decade. And uh, thanks to her advocacy and really council uh, speaker Adrian Adams, um, we're finally going to see some investments come to Peña Herrera. And so we're really excited about that. Uh, our office is also hosting a safe and healthy families workshop in partnership with the Mistec organization and the Healing Center. That'll be this Saturday, February 18th at 10 a.m. Um, at the Mistec organization, which is located at 245 23rd Street on the second floor, um, encourage folks to come learn how to build safe and healthy family relationships. Um, and lastly, a legislative update and um, 
uh, Dan Murphy brought it up last mile has been an issue affecting District 38, both in Sunset and in Red Hook. And we have a, a body of work that we've been trying to advance forward um, legislatively on the city uh, city side. Um, there will be a rally tomorrow at 10 a.m. at City Hall Park because the council member will be introducing three new builds um, uh, that, again, adds to that body of work that we, we already have. These new bills will explore new street design approaches um, for a last mile. Um, it'll uh, touch on maritime shipping alternatives, as well as mandating that the DOT study the impacts of last mile facilities on local communities and infrastructure. Um, quickly to touch uh, based on the body of work, we have three other bills that were introduced in September, which would mandate um, air quality, excuse me, mandate air quality monitoring at heavy use thoroughfares, it would mandate redesign of city truck routes and require trucks to carry GPS monitoring devices. So um, there could be some way to ascertain when they go off of um, truck routes. Um, currently, our bill for the air quality monitoring um, has 42 sponsors. So again, we're really pushing this on all fronts, both with the agencies and legislatively, because as we know, what this, the status quo is not working for us. Um, and so I'll leave it at that. Um, as always, you can reach me at eastcerna at council.nyc.gov. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. Okay, next I have Myra Molina from Congressman Goldman's office. Myra, please unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. How are you guys? Hey, Myra. Hi. So um, just an update for this month um, from Congressman Dan Goldman's office. Um, our office isn't open as of now. It may be open until mid-March. However, I want to reiterate what uh, and clarify from last month. Um, we are offering immigration services or needs, RS and tax refund matters, Social Security Administration affairs, veteran affairs, issues with the United with with the post office and any issues regarding NYCHA. So once again, um, in order to receive assistance, you must fill out a privacy release form for assistance on most federal matters. And it just um this form just means that you're getting confidential services and that we're assisting you on all privacy matters. Also, if you'd like to contact our office for constituent services, you can call 718-312-7575. Um, or, or our constituent services are open from Monday to Friday, 11 a.m. to 4 p.m. So please visit our website so we can get to you as soon as possible. Um, Dan has been... In the, in the district this week, he visited Mixteca on Monday for a meet and greet, and he was just there to learn more about the organization, and we want to commence once again, as um, previous elected officials have also mentioned, Mixteca for being on the front lines of the HERC and assisting with all migrant issues. He's also been um, there to celebrate the Lunar New Year with constituents from New York 10, and he's been in Manhattan, China, and that Chinatown and Sunset Park, which are in Brooklyn communities. Um, on February 2nd, uh, Dan Goldman visited the um, HERC in the Brooklyn Cruise Terminal in Red Hook. Um, he wants to commend the New York City for treating the situation with urgency as it requires. However, he wants to know hey, and he will be pushing for federal resources as New York City welcomes migrants with open arms and wants to make sure that they're getting the services that they need. So that's it as of now. And um, yeah, uh, I'll be putting the office phone number in the chat if you guys have any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maida. John Watkins from the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office. John, please unmute yourself. I don't think John is still, oh, there he is, I'm sorry. Oh yeah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Oh, great. Good evening, everyone uh, in CB7. Uh, uh, first of all, Dia Gonzalez has always sends his well wishes and uh, and both he and his team of ADAs and, and all the support staff are, are vigil uh, vigilantly working towards the continued safety of the community. 
Uh, and so I just, I'd like to just express that. And we are, we're really uh, a 24 hour, seven day a week operation. And uh, a lot of people don't know that there are all kinds of things going on uh, after hours and throughout the night that the DA's office uh, and the DA himself are personally responsible for. Having said that, starting off uh, last uh, Friday, uh, DA Gonzalez hosted his uh, 2023 New York legislative uh, briefing, and he was able to present uh, to multiple representatives and elected officials throughout the state uh, what has uh, transpired over the past year and what are some of his uh, goals um, uh, for the upcoming year. And some of that included uh, the report on, on Brooklyn crime statistics. Uh, some of those areas have uh, been very well. Some have gone uh, up in certain communities, such as uh, gun shootings. Uh, other uh, items that he addressed were uh, efforts to reduce violence in our communities. And this is going to be a multi-pronged approach uh, using various uh, uh, internal uh, offices as well as external agencies, <coughs> excuse me, uh, external agencies and, and other uh, support groups. Uh, and then there are the legislative priorities. Uh, there's always new initiatives that uh, must be uh, advocated to uh, the uh, the state legislators uh, that will increase uh, community safety. And uh, so uh, there are a number of things on the slate that uh, DA Gonzalez will be proceeding to, to make our community uh, safer through, through legislation. Secondly is uh, some of the events that have been hosted recently were our Lunar New Year event, which was very successful. Uh, and then uh, a few weeks ago, uh, about a month ago, we had a successful gun buyback program. Uh, throughout the year, uh, we are always trying to have uh, uh, events where we can sort of get these illegal weapons uh, off the streets. And more and more, as was as the Gonzalez presented in the legislative briefing, we have a new uh, serious problem, and that is that of ghost guns. And as was pointed out in one of the presentations that uh, one of the panelists presented from our office is that people can buy a very inexpensive 3D printer and, and with, with very inexpensive materials, they can literally uh, produce so-called ghost guns that are very, very lethal. And so this is something that uh, Brooklyn and multiple communities in New York and throughout the country are, are really confronted with now. And so that's uh, one of the highlights or one of the priorities is to, we have this new problem of not just with you know, regular manufactured guns, but these so-called ghost guns, which are, which are killing and maiming people in our community. So, so that's very, very uh, at the top of the agenda. Coming up uh, in the next uh, few weeks will be uh, Black History events, uh, as well as uh, Women's History. So please refer to our, our website for information that will be posted there. And also, I was just notified that uh, uh, the DA uh, has his office is now accepting applications for the uh, summer college internship program, and the deadline for that will be in early April. Uh, and so, again, our website BrooklynDA.org uh, will have information on that. And I would encourage people who have college-age uh, students uh, to look into that if they have an interest in in law enforcement and 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 working. Uh, throughout the summer in, in our in our office. Uh, a couple other things, uh, uh, please uh, go to our website again. And uh, oh, also, we uh, I also like to let people know about the multiple community services that uh, the DA's office uh, offers. These are free of charge. They're counseling services. They're victims uh, impact service and so forth. Uh, and so that information can also be accessed on, through brooklynda.org. That is all that I have for right now. And uh, I wish everyone very uh, safe uh, and please enjoy the, the, the early spring weather that we're having as long as it lasts. Thank you. Thank you, John. Jessica Kahlo from the Borough President's Office. Jessica, you can unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yep, yes. I can hear you. Excellent. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Jessica from the Borough President's Office. Um, Borough President Reynoso delivered his first State of the Borough 
address, which is the first state of the borough address that uh, that we've done in 10 years. So in about in about 10 years. So it was a really big deal. Uh, he talked about the progress that he's done a lot of the first that he's done uh, this last year. Uh, we've done we we're continuing to do our comprehensive planning effort. If anybody hasn't provided comments on it, I really recommend you go to our website, do the things that uh, it says to provide comment on it. It's very, um, it's supposed to include uh, planning public health effort. So um, I encourage everybody to, who is into zoning and land use stuff, do, do go comment on that. Um, the borough president laid out his four new initiatives uh, for uh, moving into 2023 which would be funding nonprofits to purchase permanent spaces. Uh, we, don't, we don't talk about enough, enough how nonprofits uh, spend too much time worrying about where they are going to be. So uh, we're going to focus funding on that. Uh, a solarization project for low income tenants, a small business incubator for black entrepreneurs and a community board reform effort. We want the community board to be of course, uh, as filled as possible and as uh, inclusive of the communities that they represent. Uh, speaking on community boards, if you don't already know, the community board application season has been extended to February 2020, uh, February 23rd, 2023. Uh, so if you haven't gotten in your community board application, I highly recommend you do. If you're supposed to be reappointed, please make sure that your application is in. Um, we don't want a last minute scramble. On that, uh, Borough President Reynoso's uh, capital funding application is open for 20 for the fiscal year 2024. The applications close the deadline for the applications are also February 23rd at 5 p.m. Uh, capital funding can be allocated to parks, streets, schools, hospitals, economic development, affordable housing projects, cultural institutions, and other nonprofit organizations. Um, last year we did uh, we funded our entire capital funding budget to uh, to hospitals because we very very much care about you know Brooklyn being a place where you can get good health care. So this year we're um, we're really trying to get down to the community nitty gritty nonprofit support. So uh, if you need capital funding, please put in your application February 23rd, 5 p.m. And lastly, uh, the borough president celebrated Lunar New Year um, with lion dancers and performances by elementary schoolers. Uh, and local residents and businesses from Sunset Park. So we want to thank everybody for participating in that event. I hope you have a wonderful month. Thank you so much, Jessica. And I think we have a, a question, uh, Pat. Hi. Uh, just a, a question for you. With the extension of the submission and acceptance of uh, application does that now also delay those who submitted their reappointments uh no it shouldn't delay anyone the i think the thought behind extending it is to hope uh is if there has been some trouble with people submitting their applications they have a chance because it's a new format they have a chance to let right, go in and right. do it all right so so for those of us that um submit it early um mm -hmm. when do we when do we hear anything um, I believe there's a deadline of uh, everybody hearing by May. Don't quote me on that. I have to double check that. Um, but we we know how long the process used to take in the past. So we want to make sure that we're getting out as soon as possible. Um, I know internally um, we're we're interviewing people uh, for for the vacancy spots and um and reappointing the reappointment members as soon as possible so everything should nothing is being held up by this this extension my apologies this is just something that i never heard before so applicants are being interviewed uh yes that's part of our new process um it's been so long for me that i actually don't remember ever being interviewed so this is why i asked Oh, Thank no, I, it's new to the borough. Manhattan does interviews, but Brooklyn did not historically. So uh, we want to make sure that we're making informed appointments. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jessica. And thank you, Pat. Next, I have Jane 
from Senator Chu's office. Jane, please unmute yourself. I think Jane has left the meeting. Okay. But she put her information in the chat. Okay, next I'll go to Frida Zorita from Senator Myrie's office. Frida, please unmute yourself. Hi, good evening, everyone. This is Frida, Senator Myrie's Director of Special Projects. Um, so we are in Black History Month. And so for the past three years, our office has used this month to talk about Black futures. Um, and so the reason is because the priorities that we're fighting for in Albany, from closing health disparities and ending gun violence to protecting affordable housing and making our criminal laws more fair and just, are about building a future where all New Yorkers can thrive, especially those who have uh, historically been left behind. And so all month long, Senator Myrie uh, will be highlighting bills that he sponsored that can help us build that kind of future. Um, our state can and, and must do the work to protect things like our environment, standing with victims and survivors of violence, holding accountable those corporations who violate the public trust and many more things. And so quickly, just let it, uh, two things legislatively, um, two of these important priorities um, advance through key committees. Um, one of them is uh, Senator Myrie's clean slate legislation, which would automatically seal certain criminal convictions to allow formerly incarcerated New Yorkers to obtain employment, housing, and other benefits. Um, and so that passed the codes committee. Um, and it's been a really great honor for, for Senator Myrie and for the office um, to fight for a clean slate alongside, alongside a, a very powerful coalition of advocates, um, businesses, laborers, and faith leaders. And so uh, we're hoping to uh, getting this bill done uh, this year. Um, and also what passed through the Coates Committee uh, was his bill to increase the maximum fines corporations pay when convicted of criminal wrongdoing. Um, these fines have remained the same since 1965, which has allowed corporate bad actors like the recently convicted Trump organization to pay very nominal costs for very serious violations of our laws. Um, and so these two bills of the many that we will continue to pass um, are integral to that kind of black future that New York must continue to build. Um, so that's on the legislative side. In terms of events and district office items, um, we have, we will be hosting our State of the District Address event on Sunday, February 26th at Medgar Evers College from 2 to 5 p.m. It's obviously an, a public facing event. So public, um, all constituents are welcome to attend. Um, we'll have uh, uh, Chuck Schumer there, Senator Chuck Schumer, um, Hakeem Jeffries there um, alongside uh, our faith leaders um, and a, a great panel of uh, performances. And so we are looking for some volunteers to assist us on the day of, um, and we can, um, if interested, you can head over to Senator Myrie's Facebook page and his Instagram um, to get more information on that. Um, and yeah, thank you so much, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you so much, Frida. Next, I have Mia Perez from Council Member Hanif's office. Mia, if you're still on, please unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Mia Perez from Council Member Hanif's office. A few quick updates. I wanted to elevate a construction training that SBIDC is leading um, in part with the support of our discretionary dollars. Um, so they're rolling out a training um, that starts March 13th. Um, and goes through fr Friday, March 31st, um, to provide five in-demand uh, construction credentials. Um, so I can put the link to that training in the chat. Um, and then just wanted to highlight that our discretionary funding um, applications are due February 21st. Um, I can also provide the link to um, discretionary funding applications in the chat as well. And then um, finally, just wanted to share that, um, you know, our office has been working with mutual aid groups um, in the district around, around the asylum seekers that are um, in our communities. And um, we have collect, we've gotten a lot of outreach from folks that want to get engaged and supporting. Um, so we've, we've collected and are regularly updating um, the requests for mutual aid groups that we're receiving. Um, so I do want to share that resource for folks that are interested. And then just one quick legislation 
um, highlight on um, a similar topic, we will be introducing legislation to ensure that the HERC centers, including the one at the cruise terminal, are abiding by right to shelter um, rules, which includes um, particular spacing, um, a part of the beds and the sizes of the beds, um, as well as um, facilities, uh, you know, like like um, showers and, and bathrooms and ensuring that there's uh, sufficient um, ratios of those for for folks that are staying at those HERC shelters. Um, so happy to also share my contact info in the chat and appreciate you all um, and hope you have a good evening. Thank you so much, Mia. Next, I have Vito Labella from Assemblyman Chang's office. Vito, please unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Vito Labella from Assemblymember Chang's office. I'll be really quick. I know everyone wants to get out of here. Uh, the assembly member has a office, a uh, te temporary mobile office, and it's located at 835 8th Avenue, room 206. And it's being staffed Monday to Friday from 10 to 5. And we also have a pop-up office at the Salvation Army at 7307 18th Avenue. And that'll be manned from uh, on Fridays from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, my information is in the chat. It's a labella v l a b e l l a v at newyorkassembly.gov and you can call our office 646-886-2475 for any constituency concerns. Thank you so much everybody. Have a great night. Thank you so much Vito. I have Emmett Mendoza from Assembly Member Matanis office. Emmett, you can unmute yourself. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Apologize if I lose communication. I'm currently on the Amtrak back from Albany. Um, just a couple of quick updates, um, not to repeat what everyone has said recently, um, but the 63rd 09 4th Avenue um, Senior Housing Apartments at Sunset Park Bridge um, applications will close on March 17th. We're currently actively trying to help people apply to the affordable housing lottery. Um, currently, it's targeted for individuals for houses that have at least one household member with who is over the age of 60 years or older. Um, and it's also targeted towards um, low income residents. Um, the income ranges stems from between $0 a year to $60,000 a year, 50% set aside for mobility disabilities and 80% set aside for vision and hearing disabilities. Um, at the same time, um, our office has sent out a request for organizations that are looking for discretionary funding. Um, today is the deadline for the discretionary funding, but if there's any last minute organizations that are looking for funding and needs an extension, um, you can reach out to me. I will provide my email in the chat box as well as to make sure that we're able to allocate funding for necessary organizations or focusing on organizations that have served historically uh, marginalized communities of color and low income and have historically not been able to acquire funding in the past. Um, just a update as well. We have signed on to a letter um, led by Jabari Brisport, our state senator, um, who overlaps, we used to overlap with us here in Sunset Park, um, but now his district stands a little bit more to the north on a letter um, to request that the state expand the cease and desist um, zones from not just East Flatbush, but also into all of Brooklyn. Um, the Department of State has only granted one area neighborhood in the borough of Brooklyn, but we want to make sure that we're able to expand this protection um, to all parts of the neighborhoods, ensuring that our elders are not targeted for more um, increased rampants of trying to get properties purchased and or taken away from them as a result of the theft. Um, a legislative update re regards to the state budget um, due to the assembly members um, membership in the transportation committee. Um, the assembly member along for colleagues in the assembly and the senate have actively pushed the state DOT as well as the MTA to address a lot of the inequities that exist, especially in regards to the MTBQE. Um, as Senator Granardis has, we have signed on to the letter to push the state DOT to become a more active partner in, it, in, in our current collective mission to make sure that we're able to address the highway. In addition to the MTA, our office is actively pushing to make sure that the MT does not increase um, fares this year by making sure that we close the existing deficit budget gap that exists. 
on making sure that we're able to provide free buses for our residents in the city, as well as making sure that six minute services is a, is a reality for a lot of our residents who require and rely on transportation to get to from work. Um, in regards to the assembly members part, um, membership in the, um, in, edu in the, sorry, in elementary and secondary education committees, uh, we're actually pushing back on charter school caps are currently being considered for being lifted. At the same time, we're also pushing for an increase in the inclusion of universal pre-K. Um, we're pushing for dedicated fundings for class size reduction, as well as making sure that we're able to provide um, expandability for child care to those children, regardless of immigration status. Um, lastly, in regards to the human services um, budget hearings due to the assembly members um, role in social services as well, we're pushing for the state to allocate funding to reimburse a total amount of $5 million for folks who have been victims of SNAP and um, public assistance death in the recent year and a half. Uh, we can be, we're doing this in collaboration with assembly members, but also in collaboration with um, State Senator um, Myrie Zoner, who has been a partner in trying to make sure that we get out to the, the Office of Temporary Disability Assistance to help reimburse these um, solar funds from families who have been impacted as well. Um, last update on regards on the housing front, um, our office is actively pushing on addressing the housing crisis and insecurities, especially around trying to implement stronger tenant protections. Um, again, use on HAVP, which stands for the Housing Access Voucher Program, which if passed will allocate um, vouchers for folks who are currently in the rest of the evictions or currently unhoused. Um, it recently just passed both the housing committees in the Senate and the Assembly, and it's moving closer to being taken to the floor. Um, we're really excited about this program, which will be able to address a lot of our crisis in regards to putting people from the shelters into permanent affordable homes. Um, we're actively pushing for due cause eviction. We are happy and excited to be able to partner with Senator Bernardis' office, who recently, as mentioned before, just signed on as a co-sponsor to the bill. Um, and we're also pushing for the Tenant Opportunity Purchase Act, which will allow tenants to purchase their homes and create, um, turn their homes into either co-ops, permanent affordable homes, or into apartments as well um, that are run by nonprofits in the neighborhood. Um, that is it in regards to updates. I hope that was quick and fast, um, but if any any questions or any updates, um, our office hours has been extended from 8.30 a.m. to 5 p.m., open hours from 8.30 to 3 p.m. Um, we're always accessible via email as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emmett. Julio, well, that's it for my list. Emmett took us home. All right. Uh, so continuing on, um, I am going to let uh, Jeremy go first with his district manager's report. Sorry. Way to put me on the spot, Julia. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I wasn't ready. OK, so first I'd like to start off a little personally and uh, congratulate um, Maria Gonzalez, our assistant district manager. Uh, about two weeks ago, Maria became a first time grandmother uh, to Dorian. So congratulations, Maria. Thank you. As I said, uh, Monday morning, hey grandma, what a big smile you have. <laughs> that I did have. <laughs> um, so, so that's our new addition. We also have uh, two board members who uh, have uh, resigned this past month, Nick Azadian and Stacey Boyd. Um, there are several meetings which the community board itself did not uh, set up, but um, I wanna make sure everybody is aware of. The BQE visiting workshops, there was a, um, an email that was sent around earlier today with a calendar about a number of organizations from the community that are holding workshops regarding um, hopefully the future of the BQE. Um, Uprose is actually having their meeting tonight. SBIDC is meeting tomorrow. Um, that was sent to our entire list. I believe there's actually somebody here who might be speaking during public comments, perhaps about uh, one of the meetings. Um, it was already mentioned that uh, Parks Department is having the virtual scoping meeting for Pena Herrera Playground. 
tomorrow evening at 6.30. Um, and it was helpfully uh, uh, posted to our chat with the link for it. The community board has also sent that around to uh, the public as well. Um, Equinor, unfortunately, this is the same night as our housing committee, but Equinor is having their design engagement public forum uh, for their facility um, at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal on uh, February 28th. We are awaiting a flyer. It's supposed to be multiple languages, but uh, we haven't received the flyer from them yet. But I wanted to make sure that you were aware of that. Uh, this seems to be my month to meet with uh, NYPD. It was previously mentioned that we met with uh, Chief McAvoy uh, in our office um, uh, uh, about the hiring process for the uh, captain. Uh, but I also met with other nine other district managers with Chief McAvoy, uh, who is uh, the chief for Patrol Borough Brooklyn South, the nine community districts, actually the nine uh, precincts of South Brooklyn. Um, the community or district managers divided up issues. I spoke about uh, traffic and parking enforcement as safety issues, as well as uh, motorized vehicles on uh, sidewalks and the need for uh, strict enforcement of that. Um, we also received a call from Chief of Patrol Shell, um, who uh, their purview is quality of life complaints. Um, I spoke to them uh, about, uh, actually not uh, from the Chief of Patrol, this is to set up a future meeting. Uh, I spoke with the Patrol Chief's uh, assistant, but I spoke about noise, uh, electric vehicles on sidewalks, parking enforcement uh, and traffic enforcement, particularly uh, with regard to trucks. Um, and then today, after a few uh, uh, meetings that have been postponed, I finally got my chance to meet uh, Captain Suarez uh, 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 from the 72nd Precinct. Uh, Cynthia already mentioned the uh, RV that was towed. I tried to get that done for six years and for six years was told by the precincts that could not be done and then they towed one vehicle and then suddenly the others are leaving because they think they're going to be towed so um really thank you to the precinct for for towing one vehicle and starting to resolve a long time uh a community issue that that just had not been addressed um I want to make sure everybody knows the City Council Government Operations Committee is meeting on the morning of February 28th at 10 a.m. on appointing and supporting New York City's community boards. Um, the citywide district managers got together and we have a plan to go together and to testify. We've divided up what we are going to testify about. Um, and I have been tasked with speaking on interpretation and translation services, which I have previously spoken to them about. Also, office security uh, and, and getting uh, an, a security evaluation for all of our offices. Um, if anybody's interested in attending and or uh, 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 providing testimony, please feel free to reach out and I'd be happy to coordinate with you. Um, liquor licenses since the last meeting in January, there have been 18 new and renewal licenses. And then finally, the NYPD stats, uh, comp stat has been emailed to all the board members. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, any questions? Thank you. Um, so I have uh, an attendee's hand up. I just want to explain to our attendees, uh, this is for board members only at this point. Uh, please feel free to raise your hand during public comment. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, my chair report will be brief. Um, I did want it to mention, uh, Jeremy did mention, uh, we had two board members who resigned, uh, Stacy Boyd and Nick Azadian. Um, who I've known for a very long time. Um, Stacy, actually, uh, I had joined the board when I was an, uh, an education committee member, not an actual board member. 
uh, so a long history there. Uh, and several board members uh, have indicated that they will not be renewing, um, uh, reapplying uh, this year. Um, and I believe one of them is here today. And I wanted to make a big um, kind of shout out to David Estrada, um, who has a long history with this board um, and who will be no stranger to this board, but will be missed greatly. Um, and uh, I just wanted to say a big thank you. Um, and I will probably still be harassing him from time to time. Um, uh, two weeks ago, I also met with uh, our new uh, 72nd commanding officer, Captain Suarez. Uh, we did talk about some of the issues that have been raised this evening. And I was very pleased to, to hear um, that things are moving. Um, but going back to uh, Ed Cerner's point, um, there were some issues just in terms of how the process unfolded. Uh, and I hope folks will stay tuned that there will be some follow-up conversations uh, moving forward about um, with uh, Chief Madry and I uh, hope folks to stay tuned for that. Um, uh, and uh, John DeLuper mentioned this earlier, but I did wanted to uh, talk a little bit about um, the meeting uh, we had, uh, I think it was last week now at this point, um, the CB7 organized some of the organizations that were funded by DOT uh, to do community outreach and just to kind of get an idea of let's put all of these folks together in a room in a virtual room and talk about what um, are the issues around the BQE. Um, it was an incredibly productive meeting uh, and I'm very, very excited about the work that's happening. Unfortunately, the same day we found out, the same day we organized this meeting, we found out that the state DOT has no plans in um, coming to the table in any of these, these discussions. So we are really going to be hammering um, the state on like what they're going to be doing, as well as really looking to our state elected on pushing um, DOT to like really get in the ball. Because if we're going to be doing all, all of the work in coming up on like what we want um the BQE to look like, the state's going to have to pitch in because if they're, if New York City DOT's plan for the North and South is like to put a couple of planters and a bike lane, that's not, that's not a real solution. Like we need long-term plans for the BQE that is significant. Um, so we're really going to be looking to our state electeds and to the state DOT for some long-term solutions. Um, I did also wanted to, and Antoinette uh, made a uh, mention to this earlier, um, uh, we have a lot of uh, really engaged committees right now, particularly housing and transportation. If you are a committee member, I encourage you to attend and participate. If you are not a committee member and want to get involved in the work that they're doing, anyone can attend the committee meeting. If you want to be a committee member, just send an email to the board. We can make it happen. I encourage folks to participate in the conversations that are happening um, and really get involved. And lastly, um, SYEP applications are now live. Um, if you know a youth aged 14 to 24 uh, who is looking for a summer job, they can now apply. If you know of a business or are a business owner yourself and is looking to uh, hire a worker, uh, we have an SYEP provider right here in our community, Center for Family Life, as well as several others. I believe BCAA is a provider, and I'm sure there are others, um, but I'm a little out of tune at the moment. Um, so apply today, and that is it for me. I, unless there are any questions, Barbara. Hey, how you doing? Great. I just wanted to find out, are we ever gonna go are we ever going to meet in person or is that something to discuss um can you bring that up again a new business yes thank you okay uh any old business cindy vandenbosch yeah i just wanted to give an update from the ability and access side of things um um, there, th thanks to the CB7 staff, um, we are going to be having 
uh, a phone call with uh, Lieutenant Anthony Adriano from NYPD. Uh, uh, and also uh, CB7 staff have been trying to connect us with DCAS as well about the issue of um, getting an accessible restroom um, at the CB7 board office. Um, and uh, and so we're hoping we're hoping to get a public meeting on the calendar within the next month alongside uh, having uh, the mayor's office for people with disabilities present. So just a heads up, keep your eyes open for that and please attend the meeting. Thank you, Cindy. Any other, any other old business? Catherine Walsh? Um, sorry, I think you can hear me. Um, the old business I wanted to bring up, um, and I realize it could have been in transportation, but there was a request, I think Cindy and others, neighbors, about um, there was a tractor trailer that had run off on, I think it was on 19th Street. And so this is basically to say, with a lot of the issues related to 19th Street and 20th Street, um, uh, and there was a request to have DOT, New York City DOT, engage uh, the community board engage the community on a really more intentional and thoughtful process around um, safety and also um, kind of how trucks in that area move around and bike lanes and everything. Um, we've requested multiple times for New York City DOT to engage the community, to have a meeting, to have a community forum. Um, they have, uh, there's been a lot of follow ups on that. They've not committed to that. Um, so I think at this point, what we're also trying to do is engage our electeds to try and make that happen. So I just wanted to address that because I know it's it's come up in at least two past community board meetings. Um, and particularly, I know Cindy, it's something that you've asked for. Um, and we've, we've tried and we've sort of exhausted our number of asks asking DOT to come to the table to engage the community on a session. Thank you, Katie. Uh, new business, Barbara. Okay. Um, I feel kind of weird bringing this up because I actually like being on Zoom, but are we ever going to meet in person? Thank you, for, thank you for raising that question. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, the executive order that allows virtual meetings is still in effect. Uh, and I uh, sent this email actually I, probably last week to Jeremy. To my knowledge, I, I believe the, that order will be expiring sometime uh, before March. Um, so we will likely, do not hold me to this, we will likely have a either hybrid meeting in March or an in-person meeting in March. I do not know. Um, but uh, I do see a the virtual meeting coming to an end shortly. Thank you. Brazil. United Sino Center, we celebrate, we still in Paris, celebrating Chinese um, New Year. Um, that's gonna be this Friday. We're gonna have a special lunch. And then on the 24th, in conjunction with Maimonides Medical Center, we're gonna receive a Spanish doctor, a specialist in heart, and he will answer questions to the seniors. So everybody, has a special invitation. And after that, the same day, we're gonna celebrate uh, Dominican Heritage Month. We like music and food and everything. So everybody had a special invitation. Thank you, Grisel. Uh, Katie? Sorry, I don't know if this is new business or to go in public comment. I just wanted to mention the New York State redistricting. That's, um, you can leave it in a business, sure. Okay, um, New York State is going through redistricting again. Um, there's actually tonight, um, it's still going on virtually um, and in person, there is a hearing related to new maps being proposed. This is for the assembly district. Um, if you were to look at the maps, you would see that there are a bunch of changes implied for, um, well, across the district, but if, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking at Sunset Park in particular. Um, and so I just wanted, I'll post the link in there, but I, I want to note that, you know, there seems to be sort of like different bites out of the current map that we have um, as opposed to what is being proposed. So now is the time to provide comments um, uh, and you can provide written testimony. I think tonight is the only night for a public hearing for Brooklyn. 
again, it's like happening right now, virtually and in person, um, but you can send in written testimony, really would encourage everyone to look at the maps. Um, I know a bunch of blocks in the 50s are affected, a bunch of the blocks in the 40s are affected, basically taking them out of the current assembly district, and there might be other parts of the district. So you want to take a look at that um, and see if uh, the implications of it. Thank you. Thank you. Pat? Okay, I'm sorry. Would you be able to confirm when you find out if um, meeting in person and not hybrid or whatever includes committee meetings? We'll get that clarification out, whether mm -hmm. virtual, whether hybrid, whether in person. We'll get that out to the full board. No problem. Uh, Barbara, I see your hand is still up. Is that from before? No problem. Um, let's go on to public comment. Uh, any member of the public may choose to raise their hand for three minutes. And I see a couple of hands up. Julio, do you want me to call them again? Yes, please. Thank you. Okay. I have Tiffany Goldwire first. Tiffany, you can unmute yourself. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi. Good evening. Um, my name is Tiffany Goldwire, and I am the community service chair for Delta Alpha Lambda Zeta chapter of Zeta Phi Beta Sorority Incorporated. We are a community-focused Greek letter organization, and we serve um, several communities in the West Brooklyn area. And we just wanted to get in touch with local businesses, schools, churches, and other community-based organizations um, to determine how we can be of service in the community. Um, if there is a community liaison on the call or someone that I can speak to regarding um, completing a community needs assessment survey, I'll put my contact information in the chat. And um, please feel free to reach out to me. We look forward to supporting the community in any capacity that's needed. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. I have Jess Giordano next. Jess, you could unmute yourself. Hi, you can hear me, right? Okay. Yes, we can. Um, Thank you. Jeremy, thank you so much for uh, mentioning the bikes on the sidewalk to the police. I'm just curious if like what if there was any update in terms of like what did they say they were planning on doing and also how we can get like residents can get more involved in trying to solve that problem as it's getting quite dangerous. So Jess, this is not a Q and a right now. I'd invite you to give me a call or an email tomorrow. I'll be happy to discuss that with you. And Thank I would suggest you. folks could start by attending both or either um, our public safety committee. And uh, there's also the uh, NYPD community council meeting, uh, the 72nd precinct, excuse me, community council meeting. And then each uh, sector has its own meeting monthly. So those are ways to get involved. Please email me tomorrow. I will. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. No problem. I have Felix uh, Omazusi. Felix, you can unmute yourself. Hello, good evening. My name is Felix Amzusi. I'm here with the Black Spectrum Theater. I'm the public relations ambassador. And I wanted to talk to you um, quickly. I don't know if it's possible for me to do a presentation. I have one, uh, but if not, it's okay. You let me know. Uh, can you do it in three minutes? Yeah, I, 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 I practice. I think I can. <laughs> Julio, you good with that? Okay. Uh, Sorry, muted. Uh, sure, if you can do it in three minutes, go ahead. Okay. Okay, I'm not sure I can give you permission to... Uh, okay, I can promote you to panelist. Hang on. Okay. All right. Hello, hello, yeah. All right, let me see. Let me share my screen. Uh, okay. share screen. Sorry, you now have permission to share the screen. Oh, okay, now I have permission. Okay, great. That's, okay, I see it here. Okay. 
Great, okay. you're on the clock. Okay, great. Thank you so much for giving me the time. Like I said, my name is Felix Omzusi. I'm the public relations ambassador for Black Spectrum Theater. Um, so briefly, Black Spectrum Theater was founded in 1970 is in Roy Wickham's Park in Jamaica, Queens. Um, it's been the home of several productions, theater productions and film productions. Uh, we had a lot of um, okay, let's go. Okay, and we have four ways to get involved with Black Spectrum Theater. Um, fundraising. I don't know if any of you are part of any organizations. You have any fundraisers that are coming up. If you want to do that, you can come to Black Spectrum Theater. Let us know what menu you want to have, what drinks you want, how you want to have your fundraisers being done. We have beautiful spaces, locations for that. Um, we also have our seasonal pass. I don't know if you've been to a Broadway show. Broadway tickets are about $100, $150. Um, with a $99, you get to watch the whole sh all the shows for the season that's about 10 shows within the year it's something for our community really really amazing shows very very educational very fun and 20 percent off the concerts as well um and then also rentals we have a beautiful space like i said we're in roy wilkins park so it's a beautiful beautiful park we have big parking space as well. So if you want to do some parties, some weddings, some uh, festivals, you can rent the space. We have, we can do mini concerts. We have outdoor um, stages as well, shuttle buses, a jazz room for something more intimate. You could volunteer with us as well. Um, we do jobs, um, any, um, we have progress, um, programs for the youth as well. It's all about empowerment. So the point of it is to just get involved with Black Spectrum Theater. And I'll take some questions real quick since I have a minute left. Um, if not, uh, I'll leave my information under the group chat to just reach out if you want to do some, um, we do a lot of organizations, some meetings with the elected officials, um, some a, a different program, just really get involved. You can check us out at www.blackspectrum.net. Um, I'm going to leave my email in the chat and my phone number, and I hope you can get involved and come check out some of our shows. It's really amazing. Oh, and I play Santa Claus one time, if that helps. Ho, 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 ho. <laughs> thank you very much thank you felix unfortunately this isn't a question and answer at this point but please do post your information and folks can get in touch with you okay, okay thank you uh julio i don't have any additional attendees with their hands up thank you and i see cynthia gonzalez thank you julio my question um refers to the empty restaurant sheds. I go around and I notice that these sheds are not even being utilized. They're being used like practically as storage spaces. Now, these are sheds that are taking a parking spots in our community and they're not serving people outside. So I want to know what is going to, you know, if anything can be done and who, who needs to be addressed about this. That's an excellent question. Um, and I'm actually going to refer this to, uh, and I see he's still on the line, to uh, Ed Cerna at the council member's office, because I believe that the council is uh, working on this. I'm not sure if there's pending legislation um, or an intro. Um, and I don't want to put him on the spot, but uh, I, I that I do hear that there's some movement on them, particularly the ones that are banned in. The, I, I do have some concerns. Um, so well, the I, I ones did. that I'm talking about, they're not abandoned. I mean, they put the lighting on to make it look like they're being utilized. But when you look inside, you see a whole bunch of like stuff in there, like tables and chairs on top of the tables. These are not sites that are looking to serve anybody because if they were, they'd have like tablecloths. They would look like somebody could sit out outside, but they're not. They're just taking up space, valuable space that we could be using for parking in this community. I would say, Cynthia, if you have specific um, locations that are of concern, um, you should re reach out to the board. Um, and I can do that, but I would like to hear what Ed has to say about it. Is he still with us? He is. I just put him on. <laughs> yeah, I'm still here, Cynthia. Um, I know I I don't have a definitive, so I would uh, I'll probably can give you a call tomorrow. But my understanding is that they were trying to um, 
they, they did some kind of changes so that the wood, like that they're more sturdier, that they're not like the wood sheds that were hastily built. They have to um, be a little bit more rigid. So I, again, I don't know exactly what the changes were, but like Julio, I, I, I think I saw that they, there was some changes made. So again, I could call you tomorrow. Um, so I have a chance to touch base with DOT because they're the ones that run that program. But Ed, is there any like monitoring of these sites? So there are ways to uh, get them inspected, Cynthia. Uh, you could call the community board if you have a specific address. Uh, Diana Gonzalez helpfully uh, posted the 311 uh, complaint form, uh, which you could click on uh, as a link. Uh, but uh, we could get individuals uh, inspected and potentially removed if they are derelict. Thanks to everyone. And I believe Cynthia Felix might want to uh, add to this. Jeremy now stole my thunder. I was going to say the same thing. <laughs> Thank you. There you go. Um, seeing as there are no other items on the agenda for this evening, um, we can adjourn, but I know people like to motion to adjourn. Is there a motion to adjourn the meeting? Motion. So motion by Cynthia. Uh, seconded by Pat. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, for those celebrating or are on vacation next week, enjoy your midwinter recess. For those who have to work, I apologize. Good night, everyone. Good night, good night everyone. Rubbing good night. salt in the wound. Damn. Good night. I'm in California, so I am enjoying my weekend already. Hey, um, Jeremy, I, I missed the roll call because uh, my 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 clock did not switch over. Jerry, I'd send an email to. Uh... Pat and Julio, I don't have the ability to change that. Okay, I'll send them an email. All right. All right, thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.